It's a beautiful prayer. Would you bow your heads with me as we continue in prayer to our Lord? (laughs) Heavenly Father, our cry to you this morning is that you would be among us, that you would be with us, that your spirit would implant your word deep in our hearts so that we would behold your son, Jesus Christ, and that we would be transformed and changed. Your word tells us that if we call out to you for insight, that if we raise our voice for understanding, if we seek wisdom like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you, Lord, will give us understanding. You will help us to understand what it means to fear you rightly, and we will find true, transforming knowledge, knowledge of you. You alone, Lord, give wisdom. It's from your mouth that it comes, both knowledge and understanding. You have stored it up, your word says, sound wisdom for the upright. You are a shield for those who walk in integrity. And so this morning, Lord, our prayer is a cry to you for wisdom, that you would reveal yourself to us through your son, Jesus Christ, and that we would delight to live a life of joyful, submitted service to our King. We love you, Lord, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would open your Bibles with me to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. This past week, Pastor J.D. and I were immensely blessed to get to go to Shepherd's Conference, which is a pastor's conference out in California. And I wanted to tell you guys that it was an amazing blessing and encouragement for us. It's an encouragement to our souls, our spirits, to be challenged and under the teaching of God's Word to see who He is, to be challenged and exhorted to live lives that are holy to be encouraged by other preachers around the world who are proclaiming the same good news about our glorious God. Along with that, they feed you like kings. So we were well-fed spiritually and nourished physically, and it was a huge blessing. And I want to bring this up because I want to say genuinely from both of our hearts, thank you. Thank you for voting and giving and intentionally sacrificing so that we as your pastors could be humbled in such a high honor to get to be blessed in that way. It's truly humbling. It's humbling to see a whole church body spend themselves to support and love their pastors. And so thank you very much. Thank you doesn't extend all the words I want to say, but it is important to express it because there's a a sacrificial service that's for the Lord that ministers to others. And that's what our text is about today. That's what our text is about. I want to look at it and read it in its entirety and hope you, you capture what it is that Paul is making a point about as we dive into God's word together. So I hope your Bibles are open as we look to see what God says In Philippians chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 19, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. Paul writes, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. But I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all And has been distressed because you have heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, 
and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. The theme that permeates the letter of Philippians is a call for believers to an entire life of joyfully serving Christ. And essential to this call is the characteristic of humility. And we've been seeing this throughout the chapter um, that we've been studying in the book of Philippians. Humility is the very mindset, Paul said, of Christ. And when we live humbly as servants of Christ, we glorify our Father in heaven. And the urging in Paul's letter is that we ought to delight in this high calling. We ought to pursue it and value it. We ought to rejoice in living for Christ. But for Paul, this joy is not isolated or individual, but it is abundant and overflowing and shared joy with the body of Christ, which means we ought to rejoice also in seeing others live for Christ, because that too glorifies God. And this is what Paul is getting at in our text in Philippians chapter 2. At a cursory reading, we find what seems to be just travel plans. But in the context, Paul is actually seeking to do something much more. He's seeking to weave together the truths he's been teaching with the realities of current life events. In this letter, Paul repeatedly and wisely both declares truth and then he depicts it. He tells you the truth and then he shows you what it looks like to be lived out in everyday life. Truth is convincing when it is both proclaimed and proven. We saw this even in our text last week, that the truth of the gospel must be shouted and sung and stated both clearly and powerfully. But it also must be shown in the lives of believers that its power has clearly transformed those who receive it. While statements may guide and guard our thinking, Stories have this captivating element. They actually compel us and move us in our affections and our hearts. Statements of truth should inform and direct our reasoning, but stories can ignite and beckon our affections toward wanting to live according to the goodness of those truths. And continuing with this pattern of show and tell, Paul proceeds to show these believers the goodness of humbly living for Christ. And then he tells them how they ought to respond when they see humble living amongst the body of Christ. This morning, as we read through our text, the goal is that we would see the author's intended message, that we would see the goodness of humbly living for Christ, so that we would not simply respond in a dutiful manner, but we would rejoice to humbly obey our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the truth that God intends for us as believers to hear this morning is this. Humble servants of Christ joyfully honor humble servants of Christ. If we are to be faithful servants who strive for obedience to our Lord, if we are going to grow in humility as servants of Christ, we ought to be people who joyfully honor our fellow humble servants of Christ. And this truth is both shown and told in our text. It is shown by two examples and told later in two exhortations. But before we dive in, I really want to set your expectations for our time together. There's going to be time spent reviewing the background of these two men mentioned, as well as walking through the commendations made about them in these verses But we must remember our goal is not to simply see great men, but to see godly men. These verses are put here so that we would see the goodness of Christ's humility on display in his children for God's glory. We must understand that glory belongs to God alone, and to give glory is tied to worship and praise that is reserved exclusively for God. But to honor, on the other hand, is to express respect and gratitude that acknowledges something that is truly valuable. 
It is godly and right to express honor and thankfulness for things that God values. So this morning, we are aiming to see the character of our Lord Jesus Christ on display in the lives of his servants. And when we see Christ-like humility on display, we will rejoice to honor them because we value Christ. Because humble servants of Christ are those who joyfully honor humble servants of Christ. The first example we find in our text is in verse 19. Look again with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send, he says, Timothy. Timothy is a young man, and according to Acts chapter 16, he was a disciple that was spoken of well by believers in his region. Paul first met him as he embarked on his second missionary journey with Silas, and they were headed to the northwest region of what's now modern-day Turkey. Paul and Silas met up with Timothy in his hometown Lystra and invited him to join in with them in the expansion ministry of the gospel throughout the entire Roman Empire. This was no part-time gig. This wasn't a try it out for six months and see if it really fits for you. This was leaving everything and everyone behind to submit and serve in the mission of Christ under the leadership of the Apostle Paul. And the first place in this missionary journey of Paul and this new team that had been assembled with Silas and Luke and Timothy, they were divinely called to a region north of the Aegean Sea. And the first stop on this journey was the prominent city of Philippi. The book of Acts recounts Timothy's really introductory start to church planting ministry. He was on the front row and saw the events unfold. He had a front row seat to Paul and Silas being dragged to a court by a mob, being wrongly tried, their backs stripped, beaten with rods before they were chained and thrown in prison. But he also experienced God's supernatural release of his comrades through a miraculous earthquake, along with this Um, divine rescue and salvation of the Philippian jailer. Timothy knew the Philippian church firsthand. He knew their names and he knew their faces. And he saw how God had worked to bring salvation to this city. He knew both the dangers they faced and the delights they felt. And likewise, they knew Timothy. Now in verse 19 of chapter 2, Paul writes to them of his plans to send Timothy back to Philippi. Look with me as we read again verse 19 through 24. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that I shortly myself will come also. Paul was dedicated to pursuing the growth of the believers at Philippi, so much so that he was willing to send his best, his protege, his right-hand man, his son in the faith, to guarantee and see to it that in his absence, they would be growing in godliness. But the Philippians knew Timothy. So why is it that Paul makes a point to honor this fellow servant of Christ? Well, it's because humble servants joyfully honor humble servants. Unlike his other letters, Paul actually inserts these travel plans in the middle of his letter rather than at the end. And it's because Paul wants to show practically how it looks to humbly live for Christ, how humility actually drives us toward joyful honoring of others. We ought to ask ourselves, what is identified as honorable characteristics of a humble servant of Christ. What does it look like? And in verse 20, Paul states that Timothy is so united to him that they are 
like sold. He describes this characteristic by saying that, they, that Timothy himself would be genuinely concerned for their welfare. This commendable characteristic of Timothy that Paul identifies is this genuine, heartfelt concern for others. It's a selflessness that puts others first. This description would have had an all too familiar flavor to its original listeners as they heard this letter read aloud in its entirety. Just a few verses previously, Paul called these believers to have, in verse 2 of chapter 2, the same mindset. The very mind of Christ, he called it in verse 5. One that he identified in verses 3 and 4 as counting others more significant than yourselves. Not looking only to your interests, but also to the interests of others. This was the very definition of humility. Timothy is being lifted up by Paul as an example of humility. But not only that. He's showing the spiritual realities that come from humility. Recall Paul's argument starting back in chapter 1, verse 27. He's been making the case that God is glorified through gospel unity. And gospel unity is only achieved through gospel humility. There's this domino effect that crawls up the chain. When we are unified together, it's because we are experiencing and living as humble servants of Christ. Humility upholds unity for the glory of God. And Paul's expressing this sort of unique, knit-together experience, this like-souledness with his brother Timothy. Paul was concerned for the Philippians. That's why he writes them and he actually sends Timothy. And Timothy likewise cares for this church at Philippi deeply and sincerely. He cares for their growth. He cares for their joy. Can you see how Christ-like humility is meant to glue and bind Christ's church together? He continues to draw the startling contrast of this Christ-like humility by continuing in verse 21. He says, For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Although we can't conclusively tell who it is that Paul is negatively comparing to Timothy's positive example, it makes sense that this would be a reference to those ill will preachers from chapter 1 who, out of selfish ambition, desire their own good at the expense of others. But what we must not miss is that Paul is making a parallel statement. He's saying, Timothy's genuine concern for your welfare is seeking the interests of Christ. Timothy's concern for these believers was in perfect alignment with Christ's interests. This is a humble mindset of Christ displayed in his servant for his church. This kind of humility enables strong unity throughout um, so that we can prioritize Christ's interests. I'm just going to read that sentence again because it didn't make sense. This kind of humility enables strong unity through prioritizing Christ's interests. Humility doesn't get us to Christ's interests. Christ's interests is what helps us grow in humility. Paul continues to make the point that this is not a new or momentary thing, but look again at verse 22. He says, But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. This sort of humble living for Christ is a characteristic that is proven over time. It is faithful. It's been tested and stands firm amidst opposition. The Philippians knew this, and Paul experienced this repeatedly in his shoulder-to-shoulder ministry with Timothy. Paul would say, jump, and Timothy would say, how high? He was eager to serve alongside others because he had a big-picture perspective. He cared about the advancement of the gospel, not the advancement of himself. Paul was clearly the senior in this relationship, but Timothy was the respectful, humble, faithful junior. And the only way that this relationship works is because both men knew their identity. 
Look back at chapter one, verse one. This letter opens saying, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. The only way there is going to be a healthy, loving, submissive, non-combative relationship between Christ's people is when there is Christ-like humility that is both present and practiced. This track record of continued humble service for Christ is central to living for Christ. The Christian life is not just temporary or occasional humble service. We are called to faithfully serve for Christ. This is what it looks like to live as servants of Christ. And this is why Paul expounds on the character of Timothy, not because they didn't know him, but because they needed to connect the dots. They needed to see the connection between truths taught and truths lived. That way, they, as humble servants, could rightly recognize and value the goodness of Christ on display in his children. But Timothy was not the only example Paul shows honor to in this text. There was another man who would be actually delivering this letter to the church at Philippi. Paul states in verse 23 and 24 that he, he didn't yet know how things would go with him in, at Rome, but he was wanting to wait to find out so that he could send Timothy to give them news of the actual final conclusion of the results. But once he had the news, he wanted to eagerly send Timothy. So this is an anticipated plan of sending that he's communicating. But Paul hopes in the Lord that he too would be able to come and visit them. So it's not Timothy who's delivering this letter, and it's not Paul who is the one delivering this letter. Who would be entrusted with this heartfelt message to the beloved disciples at Philippi? Paul continues to state, No longer his desired plans, but his certain plans. And the NSAB actually draws out this intended contrast by stating in verse 25 the word, but. Look again at verse 25. But I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Based on the context and content of this letter, Epaphroditus was a trusted church member at Philippi. And when the church found out about Paul's imprisonment in Rome, they desired to send yet another financial gift of support out of their own lack in care for their beloved apostle. During Bible times, traveling was dangerous and difficult. This trek would have been 800 miles one way. And traveling with a sum of money was precisely the target that poachers in this time would hope for. As the church evaluated who would be put in charge of this important expedition, they appointed Epaphroditus. He was entrusted with the completion of this task that was a dear desire of this church. Although they do not have information, although we do not have information outside this epistle about Epaphroditus, Paul spares no words in expressing his overwhelming affection for this dear friend and precious saint. Epaphroditus is the only person given such an extravagant and extended honoring description in all of Scripture. It's here in verse 25 that we see his description. Let's look at verses 25 through 28 together. He writes, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may be rejoicing to see him again, and that I may be less anxious." It's here in these verses that we find the second example that Paul lifts up to show practically what is to be identified as honorable characteristics of a humble servant. Paul starts by penning five descriptions of this humble servant, three which were personal and two in relationship to his home church in Philippi. 
The first three descriptions show Paul's progressive gratitude for Epaphroditus. He says, my brother, my fellow worker, and my fellow soldier. Not only was he a fellow child of God, but he was also a co-laborer in advancing the gospel. And not only did he co-labor with Paul, but he was experiencing the opposition that comes with being a faithful servant of Christ. We all around the world with the universal church have this unique and powerful unity with believers all around the world. But Paul is saying, he was in my trench. We labored side by side in a common faith with a common work amidst a common opposition. Paul continues to identify Epaphroditus in relation to his home church. He calls him in verse 25, your messenger and your minister to my need. Epaphroditus was the one sent on a mission to fulfill a sacred calling and purpose, to care for and aid the mission of Christ and the minister for Christ. This recognition highlights the representation of Epaphroditus for the whole church at Philippi. Although Epaphroditus was present with Paul, he brings with him the sacrificial love and care of the entire church body. Our text proceeds now to tell us what it was about Epaphroditus that was so valuable, so worthy of being honored. Look with me at verse 26 as we continue Epaphroditus' story. He says, For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed, because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. The cause for Paul sending Epaphroditus immediately was his deep concern for his church. The church at Philippi had found out that Epaphroditus had become seriously sick on his journey. For us, we often see sickness as an inconvenience or just something that's frustrating to have to deal with for a little while. But during these times, illness was nothing to blink at. And more than that, Paul confirms in this text that Epaphroditus was right on death's doorstep. Although Epaphroditus had calculated the potential cost to to take on such a responsibility and a task, The reality of that came quickly into view for him. And guess how this humble servant of Christ responds? Deep longing and concern for others. He was deeply concerned that his church family was worried about him, and he was wanting to continue supporting and caring for the Apostle Paul during his imprisonment, but he desperately desired for his local church to know that the Lord had been merciful and healed him. I don't know if you're like me, but when I'm sick, my first thought is not concern for others. But humble servants are those walking in the Spirit that are depending on God's grace for each and every moment and are able even to show longing concern for others despite standing at death's doorstep. While we may tend to use sickness as an excuse for self-focus, humility sees it as an opportunity to trust in a merciful Lord and to grow in humble compassion for others. In addition to longing compassion, we see that Paul highlights in verse 30 another characteristic of this humble servant of Christ. Look at verse 30. He says, For Epaphroditus nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. I think what's referenced here in the lack is simply their lack of presence. They had a great desire to love and support Paul, but they weren't with him. And so the lack that's filled here is simply that Epaphroditus took the responsibility to get their loving support and affection to him. But what's interesting here that Paul highlights is that serving Christ is risky service. The highest expression of humble love, Scripture tells us, is a willingness to lay down your life for another. Earlier in this very chapter, Christ's humble mindset was evidenced in his willingness to obey his heavenly Father, even to the point of death on a cross. 
This is Epaphroditus, a trustworthy churchman, living out even what Paul declared in chapter 1, verse 20, saying, with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Pursuing a life of Christ-like humility is risky business. You will be constantly pressed to lay aside the ideals of our common society, to risk comfortable relationships, to risk profitable career paths, to risk even personal convenience, all because you are aiming to be a humble, faithful, compassionate servant of Christ. It has been widely said that ministry, uh, sorry, excuse me, wisely said that ministry co- that costs you nothing accomplishes nothing. There is always a cost to humbly living for Christ. But friends, although there is real risk involved in living for Christ, it is no gamble. For the believer, heaven is secured by the death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at conversion, we are permanently indwelt with the Holy Spirit as a down payment, as a guarantee of our future inheritance. So brothers and sisters, when you believe eternity is settled, risky living for Christ is a delight, not a dread. It's an opportunity to trust in our mighty God and rest in his promises. Paul lifts up Epaphroditus as an example of honorable living for Christ. Being a humble servant of Christ looks like selfless compassion for others in risky service for Christ. After expounding on these two examples of humble living for Christ, Paul calls the church now to respond. He calls them to both an appropriate and a heartfelt acknowledgement. Look with me as we read Paul's instructions for the Philippians and for us in verse 28 through 29. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, And that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. Paul was excited and eager to send Epaphroditus because he knew the blessing and benefit this would be to the church at Philippi. His actions were driven by an anticipation of their joy. And although we have seen explicitly throughout our text these Christ-like characteristics of humble servants, what is implied and woven throughout the entire story is that Paul has been lifting up these examples because he is himself joyfully honoring humble servants. Paul spends all this time joyfully honoring these guys, and he says, you too ought to joyfully honor such men. This is the power of show and tell. You see the beauty and goodness of truth so that when you hear it summarized, it rings out as this sort of familiar melody in your ear. If we are going to grow in humility as servants of Christ, we too must joyfully honor Christ-like humility in our fellow believers. But we must recognize that there is this common thread in all the previous commendations. It was repeatedly highlighted in every characteristic that was honorable about these men in the display of this character and that it was all Christ-like. It was Christ-like both in their affections and how they felt towards others, but also in their actions toward others. These men are flesh and blood examples of God's grace transforming his children to grow in Christ-likeness. Seeing Christ-like humility ought to cause our hearts to rejoice and give honor because it's rooted in our supreme love for the Lord Jesus Christ. To honor someone is to value them highly and greatly. It's to show respect and gratitude. In 1 Chronicles 29, King David prayed, acknowledging that honor itself comes from God. And the reason that all honor comes from God is because he is the only one who can rightly assess what is truly valuable. And God tells us in his word what it is that he values, what it is we are to give honor to 
And it's always tied up in either character or position. In character or position. And God's most frequent commands in scriptures to honor is honor your father and mother. This is a honor of position. There is no conditional clause that says, well, if they do everything perfect, or, or even it doesn't say if they're Christians. It just says, honor your father and mother because they're your father and your mother. And God tells you, because of their position, they are worthy of honor. They are due honor because God appointed them to the task of being your parents. But in our text, there's this overwhelming evidence that we see to honor in such men because of their Christ-like character, their humility. And just as the worthiness of our right standing before God is rooted in the righteousness of Christ alone, likewise, the worthiness of a believer to receive honor is attached to the Christ-likeness of his life. The worthiness has nothing to do with their personality, has nothing to do with their wealth, it has nothing to do with their popularity. It has everything to do with their humility, with their likeness to their Lord. When our hearts delight to honor the Son, we will joyfully honor humble servants of Christ because they look like Jesus. This text has highlighted how we ought to joyfully honor humble servants of Christ. How does your heart respond to the ministry of other believers in our church? I think sometimes we're apathetic. We're uninterested or just unconcerned about other people. Sometimes we're entitled. We think we deserve to be served. And we're not willing to lower ourselves to acknowledge those who are in our mind just doing what they're supposed to do. Sometimes we assume the worst. We're eager to feed our ego and sinful pride and we spend one second to say the words, Thank you, but we'll spend a whole hour on this internal dialogue about how we would have done it better. Or even worse, we assign evil motives to their actions. We want to honor ourselves and are reluctant to show honor to others. But the issue is not merely our lack of attentiveness to others, it's not merely our selfish ambition. It's our lack of affections for Jesus Christ. See, the truth of the matter is you won't celebrate what you do not cherish. You cannot honor what you do not highly value. And in light of our text this morning, if you cannot rejoice in Christ-like character that you see in others, you do not cherish the character of Christ. Our sinful flesh wars against this sort of joyful honoring of others. And do you know why? It's because it's intrinsically humble. To lift someone else up necessarily puts you underneath. If honoring your fellow servants of Christ feels like pulling teeth to you, it's likely that there is a pride issue in your heart. You're not only failing to follow the instructions of Scripture, but you're also essentially saying statements like this, I'm not excited about God's transforming grace at work in his people. I'm not concerned with God making other Christians holy. I just want others to see me as holy. I'm so absorbed in myself and my mission and my ambition that I don't value God fulfilling his promises, his purposes, and making his children more like Jesus Christ. If you have been bought and redeemed by the blood of Christ, you have been saved to live as a servant of Christ that prioritizes Christ's mission, not our own. The mission is to glorify God by being and making disciples of Jesus Christ, to bringing God glory through seeing the salvation of sinners and the sanctification of believers. His mission is so much bigger than any one individual. It's about his glory on display in his entire church. And one litmus test for us to see if we are those who are submitted to Christ's mission and not seeking our own is asking this question. Do I joyfully honor those who humbly serve Christ? Christ. 
Is there a capacity in my heart to rejoice with others or not? To express respectful gratefulness in both word and deed to those who humbly serve me for the Lord. If maybe you're like many of us this morning, there's this sort of conviction that says, I I see it there, I see it, but it's not where it needs to be. I would encourage you to to recognize that there, there also is in our lives this growing instinct of delighting in truth. Let me encourage you how to grow this instinct. This instinct is grown by meditating on the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the issue is our affection for Christ, we must soak in and savor Jesus Christ himself. And when we're amazed and humble and grateful for Jesus Christ, it will evidence itself in our relationships to one another. And I think the majority of this text is really pointed at, this is not highlighting some celebrity pastor. He picks the junior. He picks the church member. He's not saying that there's a lack of honoring pastors. There's a different text for that. This is saying, how do you honor people who are shoulder to shoulder with you in ministry? How do you honor the women who serve in our nursery each week? The men who come in and serve our body by making sure we have a facility that's functioning so we can actually worship Christ together? Do we express gratitude and thanks for the glory of God and the encouragement and honor of those saints? We are to joyfully honor humble servants of Christ. And when we do so, we will both attack the selfish pride in our own hearts and give glory to our Father in heaven. This morning, if you've been unmoved by the beauty and goodness of humility, I want to point you to one more example. One whose story echoes throughout this entire text. You see, there was a man who was sent so that you could have joy. One who was genuinely concerned for your welfare, your good. One whose proven worth was evident by his humble obedience to his Father in heaven. One who, despite immense personal sacrifice, was longing to cleanse you and rightly reconcile you to your Creator. So much so that he died a shameful death on a cross in your place. This person sent on your behalf is the very Son of God. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. The one and only sinless Savior who who came to atone for your sin by his own death and who rose on the third day securing both eternal life and his eternal rule with his people if you can see the goodness of Christ's humility for you, my friend, humble yourself in his sight. Cry out to God to be merciful to you, a sinner, and he will lift you up. And at that moment, you will be given a new heart, a heart that will rejoice both to receive and honor Jesus Christ as your Lord for your entire life. That's the good news of the gospel. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When you treasure Jesus Christ, when you know him as your Lord and Savior, it will come out in your words and deeds toward his people. And this is the reason. It's because humble servants of Christ joyfully honor humble servants of Christ. Would you pray with me? Lord, our hearts are filled with amazement at your provision, your love, your sacrifice, your humility, that you would come down, that you would send your only son to take on flesh and humble himself to the point of death on a cross. Lord, that's a a beautiful fragrance and aroma to those of us whom you have granted the gift of repentance and faith, to be able to rejoice in singing your praises, who see the good news, and to the Lord, some, it smells 
horrible. Lord, give us sight and ears and sense of smell and taste to see and savor the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you would sovereignly bring about salvation for those who don't know you. Lord, our hearts long and desire to see salvation brought and wrought inside of your children, those whom you have called. We pray that you would call many more to salvation. And Lord, for your church, for us here at Redemption Hill, Lord, I pray that you would use your word by your spirit to root out any sort of selfish ambition, any sort of pride that would would break apart the unity of your bride. Lord, we want to be glorifying you by living as humble servants, unified in the gospel truth. And so our prayer is that you would glorify your name by convicting us of our sin, by showing us that we need to bring our sin into the light, that we are to confess it to you, to even to one another, that there may be healing, that there may be restoration and forgiveness. And Lord, we praise you for the work that you are already doing and that you will do. Because we know that in your word it says, you have begun a good work, and you will bring it to completion. Lord, we pray that you would produce in us a joy and delight to be your servants. Lord, help us to praise and glorify your great name in the way that we live, both in repentance and obedience. Help us to glorify you by by being the type of people that express joyful honor to those who are serving on our behalf. Help us to encourage one another in the fight to live not for ourselves, but for you. And we pray for your grace to continue to encourage and strengthen us as we know that you are glad and longing and lovingly uh, going to do. So we praise you and thank you for all these things and pray this in Jesus' name, amen.